1 Samuel chapter 9, what I would entitle this chapter is Saul's humility. What we find here is the, the man Saul, of course, who was the first king of Israel. Uh, when we think about him, we often think about how his life ended. When he first passes, when he, when he goes off the scene, the, the way he, his life just ends tragically, his downfall. But really, there are some, uh, some attributes about Saul that we should look over. And when he started out, Saul was a very humble person. And I believe that as we look at this chapter tonight, we'll see that Saul uh, had some real humility about him. And they'll also you know, take heed to that, uh, to, to the fact that you know, no matter how humble a person is, you know, we can ruin that. You know, humility is not something that, that you, uh, you know, make a part of yourself and then you don't have to keep in check. It's something that we have to constantly be reminding ourselves to stay humble or get humbled. Stay humble or get humbled. So I would call for Samuel 9, 9 tonight, Saul's humility, because I think it's a great picture of that, of Saul's humility, what he had when he started out. <laughs> and of course it says there, in verse 1, now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. For his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. So, of course, we see right here several reasons why Saul might be getting, you know, might have reason to be somebody who's puffed up or lifted up with pride. First of all, his father, Kish, was a man of influence, right? It says there that he was a mighty man of power. Now, I don't mean this, think this means that, you know, he could deadlift a bunch of weight or that he could squat or something. You know, he wasn't putting up big numbers in the barbell. That doesn't mean by power. What it means there is that he's got, you know, influence. Yeah. He's a mighty man of power. And even the fact that he's, you know, sending his son to seek after these lost asses of his, you know, that would tell you that he probably had some wealth, you know, if, if he's got, you know, all these asses just running wild, he has to go find, find them, you know, that was probably akin to, you know, owning, uh, you know, several vehicles or something like that today. You know, that'd be something that you would want to go and recover. I don't think every single person, you know, had, they didn't have like a, you know, two car garage with a bunch of asses in it. You know, there was a, it was kind of a luxury to have that. People did a lot of walking back then. So we can see one reason why Saul, you know, or one, uh, one excuse Saul might have had or a reason to become puffed up is the fact that, you know, his dad was somebody. And we'll see here that, you know, even despite his father's standing, you know, mighty man of power, he has this wealth, he still considers his family what? Well, we read it in verse 21. The least of all the families of Benjamin. I mean, that's a pretty humble statement to say. Even though he could say, well, of course you picked me. Of course I'm, of course all the eyes of Israel upon me. Who else are they going to be upon? Don't you know who my dad is? He's a mighty man of power. No, that's not what his, what, his, what his response was. When he was told, hey, all the eyes are upon, of the Israel upon thee, the desire of Israel is upon thee. He said, who am I? I'm nobody. So you could see when he started out in his life that he had a very humble, a very meek uh, you know, perspective of himself. He, he didn't think too highly of, of himself. What about his physical stature? Right? It, it, uh, what we read here is the fact that you know, he, uh, Saul, it says there in verse 2, was a choice young man. You know, he was a good-looking guy. It says he was good he, and goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. And from his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of, these, any of the people. So, you know, he's a big guy. He's got this physical stature. You know, and sometimes guys can let that go to their head. They can think, hey, you know, they can be, become these muscle-bound maniacs. You know, the guys that just live in the gym, you know, and just get huge and bulked up and, and just look down on everybody else. And think that, you know, I could just, you know, I could squash all you girly men. I could just, you know, <laughs> and just think about how they could beat up everybody. And that goes to people's heads all the time. And you see them when they're walking around and they got the little thin muscle shirt, you know, and they're just, you know, and whatever. It's good. You keep it in, in physical shape and stuff like that. But when you make your life all about, you know, your muscles and how big you're going to get, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's vanity. Yeah. And it's pride is what it is at the end of the day. So we could see that'd be something else that Paul, or not Paul, but Saul could have gotten puffed up about how big he was, that he was head and shoulders about every, above everybody else, that he was goodly, that he was choice, but he didn't. You don't see him anywhere, you know, using that to his advantage. <coughs> so despite, you know, his, his father's influence, despite, you know, his physical stature, Saul is a very humble man. That's what I believe. Now, one thing I'd point out here, and I don't think we, we often think about this, is the fact that in, uh, when he's being sent out to find these asses, this isn't like David, who was, when his, when his dad had him be the keeper of the sheep and he was the youngest and he was just a lad. 
I believe Saul in this passage is a grown man. I believe Saul is a grown man with a family. And the reason why, you know, I believe that, if you would, go over to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. <coughs> so even as a grown man with a family of his own, he's still, you know, serving his father. He's still a, a submissive to his dad. His dad's saying, hey, you got to... Now, maybe it was just because it was part of the family business. I don't know. But he didn't just say, well, pff, go, you've got servants, dad. You can tell one of them to go find it. Right. You know, I'm, I'm busy raising a family or whatever. He said, no, I'll go, I'll go look. <coughs> If you look, you know, and one of the reasons I believe that he was older is the fact that, uh, we'll look at 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Saul reigned one year, and he went and reigned two years over Israel. And then, of course, we know the rest of the story. Look at verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Of course, he sacrificed before Saul, or excuse me, before Samuel came. You know, and he offered the sacrifice, which he was not supposed to do, and he was rebuked. And this is only two years into his reign as king. And he says, uh, you know, now the Lord would have established thy kingdom forever. And so this is very early on in, in, the, in his reign. And he reigned 40 years in Israel. So very early on, he's told, look, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to last. You've already messed it up. Now I'll go over to 1 Samuel chapter 14. This is in that same time frame. Look at verse 47. So Saul took the kingdom over Israel. So 1 Samuel 14, the end here at verse 47, it's kind of like a synopsis of everything that we've read so far. He kind of sums up, brings us back up to speed. He says in verse 47, So Saul took the kingdom over Israel and fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the children of Ammon, against Edom, and against the kings of Zobah, and against the Philistines, and whithersoever he turned <coughs> himself, he vexed them, and he gathered an host and smote the Amalekites and delivered Israel out of the hands of them that spoiled them. And then it goes on in verse 49, Now the sons of Saul were Jonathan and Ushuai. And Jonathan, by this point, we know, is already a grown man of war. So I believe when we're reading here in 1 Samuel chapter 9, when we're, when we're looking at Saul, we're looking at a grown man who has a family of his own. Now, does, are all of his children adults? I don't know. But I know I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fairly confident in saying that he was at least had, you know, Saul, or excuse me, Jonathan, who was of age. <coughs> so even as a grown man, again, this is just to show you the humility that Saul had when he started out in his life. Of course, Saul, you know, ended his life very poorly, but that's, you know, these things are written unto us that we might take heed. And these are written for our admonition. Amen. So we might be in here tonight and feel like we're pretty humble. You know, hopefully we're not, you know, telling everybody how humble we are. You know, but even if we are, you know, genuinely humble people, you know, there's still a, always a possibility for us to get puffed up yeah. and to get, pro get proud about different things. And that's what happened with Saul. And we see several reasons he could have gotten puffed up early on in his life. His dad, his physical stature, the fact that he was a grown man, somebody else, some other man's telling him what to do. You know, but he didn't do that. Why? Because Saul had some genuine humility. And we see that because, of course, in verse 3, and the asses of Kish, uh, uh, asses of Kish Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his, Saul, his son, take now one of thy servants with thee and arise and go seek the asses. And what I like about this is not only does he go, but he's persistent. You know, he doesn't just go check real quick and say, yeah, I couldn't find him. You know, he didn't, he didn't do like the, you know, when mom tells the kid to go clean the room. And he, he spends about two minutes in there and just shoves everything in the closet or under the bed. It's clean, mom. You know, he's persistent. He follows through. He makes sure he's doing exactly what it is he's supposed to be doing. Look at verse 4. And it says, and he passed through Mount Ephraim. I mean, um, you know, he's, he's, he's going on a journey here and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they found them not. And then he turned back and said, yeah, I looked, but you know what? I couldn't find them. They're, they're gone. Sorry, Dad. He says, no, then they passed through the land of, of Shalem, and they were not. Then they passed through the land of the Benjamites, and they found them not. And they were come to the land of Zuf. Saul said to his servant that was with him, come, let us return. Lest my father caring for these asses, uh, leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. So Saul here, you know, he's a grown man. He's got some humili real humility about him. And this is the man that God is going to use as the first king of Israel. Of course, God knows the beginning from the end. He knows what's going to happen with Saul. But I believe he used Saul, you know, as an example to us that we can start out very humble. But if, you know, if we get exalted or lifted up, you know, or just through the pride of life, you know, we can become very proud, arrogant, puffed up people. And our lives, we could ruin our lives through pride. Pride is one of the most destructive things in a person's life. I mean, you could talk about all the different sins that are out there that people get involved in and, and, the, and the physical havoc that just it wreaks on their health. But you know what? Pride is a spiritual sin that will destroy you, even far worse than a lot of these other physical sins and these other addictions. People who get proud and lifted up, they destroy their lives. 
And what this shows us here is that, you know, God uses humble people, right? And that God uses, you know, I think it's, it's, it's no, uh, it's not a coincidence that God chose a, a married man to lead his people, okay? God chose a grown man who had some experience, had some humility to lead his people. And what that should tell us is that God doesn't use young punks to lead his people. And God doesn't use, you know, all these. And look, I know there's single young guys in here that are good guys. You know, I'm not trying to just blast every, every single guy in here, right? But there's a lot of young single guys out there that are just punks. And they think they've got it all figured out. They think they've got no better than everybody else. And they're going to tell all these pastors how to do things. They're going to disagree with what the pastor's doing and the decision he makes. They're going to go online and just spout, the, run their mouth and just tell everybody how ev wrong... This pastor is wrong. This pastor is not saved. Just on and on and on. And they're just a bunch of young punks. And they're full of pride. And that's not who God uses. God doesn't use young punks. You know, young, these young guys that, you know, want to tell dads how they should run their house. Say, so, well, I don't think he, he, did it. he didn't handle that situation correctly. Well, you know what? That's funny because, you know, you haven't raised anything besides an eyebrow. You know, I, what have you done with your life? Well, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with the church and how the church should be run. And you can't even run a dishwasher. You know, and you're going to come in and tell us how to run a church. They're young punks, and God doesn't use young punks. And everybody starts out young, but not everybody has to be a punk, right? And what's a punk? You know, this rebel kind of attitude, just, you know, going to buck the system, go against the grain. You know, it, no. What you need to be is, is humble, obedient, and, and, and be a blessing, Amen. you know. You know, there's a reason why God uses grown, mature, seasoned men to lead his people because that's what it takes. You know, the Bible says, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? <clears throat> and if you haven't run a house, you know, you're a novice leader at best, you know, when it comes to running things. God uses humble men to lead his people. I mean, we look at Moses, probably like the greatest leader that ever was, you know, besides Christ. You know, he was a great leader. But what was he? He was the meekest of all men upon the earth. He didn't have this puffed up attitude. Let's go back to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, look at verse 6. Behold, and he said unto him, Behold now, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. So of course, you know, let's not forget where we are in the story. Saul goes looking for these asses. He can't find them. He's about ready to turn back, lest his dad gets worried. And starts to care for him more than for the asses. And his servant says, well, hang on. You know, there's, there's a man of God. In the, in, uh, there is in this city a man of God, verse 6. He is an honorable man. All that he saith surely come to pass. Now let us go thither. Peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. And then Saul said to his servant, But behold, if we shall go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring the man of God. What have we? And the servant answered again and said, Behold, I have brought, I have here at hand a fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man to tell us our way. And then verse 9, Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come, let us go to the seer, for that he is now called the prophet, was before time called the seer. Then said Saul to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was. So Saul, of course, you know, he's not objecting to going and seeking the counsel from the man of God because he knows better. You know, again, this, is, this isn't him just being like, well, what's the man of God, what's the man of God gonna tell me? What do I need him for? What, what he, like, he knows something I don't? Well, yeah, maybe he does. You know, I mean, especially Samuel, of all people at this time. I mean, if you remember in the story, he's, he's an old man. You know, he's been judging Israel for a long time. And he's even got this testimony that, hey, whatever he says comes to pass. He's saying, look, he's got a, tra a track record that you can trust. And look, when you have a man of God, when you have a leader that has proven himself, you know, the default position should be, let's trust him, Amen. right? And you know what? It should also be, let's honor him. Amen. And Saul here, you know, he's humble enough to seek and to honor the man of God. And, you know, that's a big thing. And that requires, again, that requires a certain level of submission. Right. I mean, that's why the man of God has to be a strong leader because he's trying to lead other men. And men by nature are not followers. All, every, all men are leaders. So for a man to, to say, hey, I'm going to get behind another man and, and let him lead me and advise me and counsel me and, and, and show me the way I have to go and help me, you know, that takes a, a level of humility on the follower's part. And it takes a level of honor. 
And if you would, uh, let's go over to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Because this is something that, you know, quite frankly, has fallen by the wayside. And, I, and, I, and especially, you know, I seem to notice it a lot, even in, in you know, the new IFB churches, churches in our movement, whatever you want to call it, is you have a lot of people, you know, that are coming in that have, that have no church background. And that's great. You know, you want that. It means we're reaching people that other people aren't reaching. Right. Right? They're being brought in. They want to get in church. They want to learn the word of God. They want to serve God. That's great. But there's also lessons that they haven't learned along the way. And that what part of that is, is, you know, honoring the man of God, having respect for the authority in the local church. This is something that kind of goes by the wayside. And again, and usually it's these, you know, the young punks that just want to, you know, tell everybody how much better they have. They have it all figured out and, and nobody else knows anything. But look here in uh, Hebrews chapter 13, look at verse 7. He said, remember them which have the rule over you. He's saying, so he says, remember, because quite frankly, there's a tendency to forget this. That the man of God is somebody that ought to be honored. That's somebody that ought to be, you know, trusted. Until proven otherwise. Until he gives you a reason not to. You know, that, that somebody that you should just default position should be, let me honor him. You know, but that starts by remembering this. That there are people that have the rule over you. Of course, that's in the local church. You know, that doesn't mean, you know, like me as the deacon down here who's pastoring this church. You know, I'm not going to be following up on you guys. You know, I'm not going to be stopping by suddenly. You know, going and seeing what kind of magazines you got on your coffee table. You know, I'm not, that's not what it's, it's, you know, they have the rule, but it's within the house of God. But make no mistake about it, they rule in the house of God. And when the, when the man of God makes a decision in the house of God, that's it. And it doesn't matter if the church agrees with it or not. And if they don't like it, you know, there's the door. And that's the way it goes. It's not, you know, the, the man of God should not be this paper tiger leader. We're just like, oh, he's the man. Of, yeah, he's in charge. We know. But, you know, when it really comes down to it, we make the decisions around here. No, that's not. That is not the New Testament church. I mean, this is very clear in Scripture. Somebody here has the rule over you. And who is it? Who have spoken unto you to the word of God, whose faith follow. He's saying, look, get behind those that rule over you. They've spoken unto you the word of God. He's talking about the preachers. He's talking about the elders. He's talking about the bishop here. Look at verse 17. Here's a word a lot of people don't like today. Obey. You know, that's like this derogatory term everybody's putting on a t-shirt or a hat. Obey, sheeple. It's like, well, the Bible says obey. Obedience is a, is a good thing. Obedience takes humility. You know, the, the rebel and everything, that's, that comes from pride. <coughs> he says, obey them that have, what's that rule again? Or word again? Rule over you. And submit yourselves. I mean, somebody's got to be in charge in the local church. And it's the man of God. And it says there in verse 24, salute all them that have the rule over you and all saints. <coughs> you see, some people, you know, they want the advice of the man of God, but they don't want, you know, they, want, they love it when they can go and they can listen to some preacher and he's going he's gonna to get on the topic that they like, you know, like the homos, you know. And this is, this is let me just get this off my chest. This is, you know, the, the new IFB fanboys, okay? It's a thing. Mark it down. Oh, they love it when the preacher gets up and just starts ripping on the fags, starts ripping on the Jews, it starts ripping on this and starts ripping on that. And they're like, amen, yeah. They love it. And that's great. I love those sermons too. But they can't stand it when their idol, you know, when, when their hero turns on them and says, hey, you got something wrong with your life. You need to fix it. You know, when they come to some, some guy and say, hey, your wife's out of control. You need to get her mouth under control. And all of a sudden, their hero becomes their enemy just overnight. Because he, he points out something that's wrong with them. You know what that tells me? That they were never submitted. They don't know what it means to obey. They're not humble. They're full of pride. They're just fanboys. That's all they are. They're just in it for the spectacle that they perceive. Some people, they love the advice. They love the show. They love that, but they, they don't want to be told what to do. They definitely don't want the man. And now, is that Saul? No, Saul here in the story says, well said. Let's go talk to the man of God. Do we have anything to bring him? He doesn't want to just walk up. Hey, hey, Samuel, I've got to talk to you. Come here. <laughs> you know, he's like, let's bring something. Let's honor him. Let, he, this, is, this is the man of God. <laughs> let's get some advice from him. Now, look there in uh, verse 11. And it says, as they went up to the city, they followed young men, uh, excuse me, they found young maidens, 
going out to draw water. And he said unto them, Is the seer here? <laughs> and they answered them and said, He is. Behold, is before you. Make haste now, for he come today to this city. So remember, Samuel at this point, you know, Samuel, as we read last week, has been going in a circuit. You know, and, and just he goes around from city to city to city throughout the year judging. You know, so it, it's interesting that he's here at this exact time, right? He says, look, he said, for he came today to the city, for there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. As soon as ye come into the city, ye shall find, uh, ye shall straightway find him before ye go up to the high place to eat. The people will not eat until he come, because he, ha he doth bless the sacrifice, and afterwards they shall eat that be bidden. So, <clears throat> what, what's going on here is in the story is that, first of all, it's real interesting that they, he happens to find the city the same day that Saul's there, right? Saul, Saul, now what, did Saul start out looking for the man of God? Did he start out going, well, I'm sure we'll find Samuel down in that city? No, he had no idea that he was even going to run into Samuel. This wasn't even on his radar. Saul sets out, and all he thought is that he was just looking for his dad's lost asses. You know, he's just being a good son. He's going out and, you know, helping protect the family business or whatever. And, but what's really going on in the story is that he's being led by the Lord. <clears throat> Because if you look there, in ver it says in verse 14, 14, And when they went up into the city, and they were come into the city, behold, Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. So not only is it, you know, it's just a coincidence that he comes to the right city, but he actually shows up, he gets to the city as, as Saul, Samuel's coming out of the city. This is like perfect timing, okay? And it says, And Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear, a, uh, a day before, excuse me. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Samuel, uh, Saul came saying, tomorrow about this time, I will send thee a man. So God's saying, look, I'm going to send thee a man. Now, how did he send him? Did he take, did he take Saul and put him in a box and tape it up and write to Samuel and, and ship it? <laughs> no, he led him there. Now does Samuel, but Saul didn't know that. Saul didn't know he was being sent by the Lord. He just thought he was out doing what he was supposed to do. But the Bible says here that God, he said, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over the pe my people Israel, that he may save them out of the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry is unto me. So again, Saul, he's just going about his business, just thinking he's looking for the lost ass, his lost asses. But we see here, I mean, the, it's just, this isn't coincidence, folks. And God just straight up tells him, look, I'm sending him to you. And, you know, this is kind of a side note from the, you know, the theme of humility, but... You know, I thought it was worth pointing out is the fact that, you know, sometimes when things go wrong in your life, when there's, you know, tribulation or trials or whatever, you know, the asses get lost in your life you know, and you have to go journey some hard journey and it just seems like you can never get to the end. You never find them. You just keep looking and it just seems like all is lost and you're worried about other people are going to start taking care for you. You know, it's, it might just be that God's leading you. It just might be that God has a purpose behind all of that. I mean, when those asses take off and he says, hey, you got to go find them, I'm sure he wasn't just like, yippee, you know. I mean, he's got a family at home. He's probably got other duties to take care of that are being neglected while he's out just tromping around through the wilderness. But God had a purpose behind it, you know. Now, was it convenient? Look, God's will is not going to be convenient. God's will, you know, if, you, if, if you're presented with options, that, you know, the easy way and the hard way, most of the time, God's will is the hard way. Because what does it do? It teaches us character. It teaches us... You know, how to be better people, teaches us patience, you know, gives us experience and hope. It's, it's, it's not always going to be easy when it comes to the Lord's will. But we always know that all things work together to good for, the, uh, for them that love God, to them that are called according to his purposes. Just like it did with Saul. You know, he's probably out there. Look, he said, we have no bread in our vessels. Everything's spent. We don't have anything. We're going to starve out here. We better get back. But it worked out to his good because he was being anointed king. You know, the Bible says, be not, now go over to Proverbs chapter 3, Proverbs chapter 3, because this is an important concept. And why was God able to lead Saul? Because he was leadable, because he had humility. God's not going to lead proud people. God's not going to show people and teach people and instruct people who are too puffed up for their own good. <clears throat> it says in Psalm 37, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. It's the steps of a good man. Now, what makes a man good? You know, his humility. 
a lack of pride, his, his obedience, the submission to the, to the word of God and things like this. Now look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. That all sounds good, but what does it say in verse 7? Be not wise in thine own eyes. Say, well, I want God to direct my paths. I want God to delight in my way. Well, then don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't be some conceited, puffed up jerk who thinks he's got it all figured out and knows everything. Because look, there's, there's not a person in this room tonight that has it all figured out. And we're all going to make mistakes. And, 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 and you know, life's not all about just coming out, coming out on the other side looking good. It's about serving the Lord through good times, through bad times. And even if we have to, you know, you know, trip and fall and stumble and make mistakes, so be it. Amen. You know, God will lift us up. You know, God, if, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, the Bible says. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. But if you want that for your life, if you want God to uphold you and see you through, you can't be wise in your own eyes. You can't think you know everything and be this proud, arrogant individual. Now go back to 1 Samuel uh, chapter uh, 9. So that was just kind of a side note there. But I thought it was interesting that, you know, you got Saul showing up at the exact time uh, uh, Samuel's there. A man, that, I mean, that wasn't Samuel's home. That's not just where he was all the time. They're coming out of the city the exact same time, meeting each other. And there's a purpose behind everything that had been going on in, in Saul's life. Now look here in verse 17. In verse 17, it says, And when Sa Samuel saw Saul... The Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spake to thee of, the same shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, uh, where, where the seer's house is. And, he said, and, and Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me into the high place, for ye shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go, and I will tell thee all that is in thine heart. And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. So that's amazing right there. Just this little miracle that, that, you know, just like the guy said, all that he saith come to pass. He's like, look, I already know what you're here for and don't worry about it. So now don't take this as like, if, if you lose your car keys, you can just call up the pastor. <laughs> and just be like, hey, just, do you know where those are? You know, like that's not, that's not how that works. This is, a, this is the way it used to be, right? This is a special miracle, okay? <coughs> anyway, and he says in verse 20, uh, uh, let's pick it up in 21. And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? So again, there's that humility. He be told in verse 20, who, uh, And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on thy father's house? <laughs> well, well, naturally. <laughs> who else would it be on, Saul or, or Samuel? Don't you see how tall I am? No, he's saying, look, I'm the smallest of the tribes of Israel. And my family is the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. I don't know if that's true or not. And from what I read earlier in the chapter, I don't know, maybe he's just talking about maybe they didn't have as many people in their family numerically. I don't know. But I don't think he's saying that he's just some pauper, just some poor guy who doesn't have, you know, two nickels to rub together. I think what he's referring to is something else. And it's just showing us, you know, his humility. Wherefore then speakest thou to me? And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden, which were about 30 persons. So he's, you know, he's got no food. He's out on this hard journey and he just humbly, you know, meekly just goes and entreats the man of God. And what happens? Boom. He's just instantly exalted. I mean, he gets sat down at this VIP dinner, you know, and, and Saul, he started out very humble, but we can see already how he's just been exalted. And that's how it works with the Lord. You know, it, you know, the Bible says before destruction, the heart of man is haughty and before honor is humility. Everybody wants the honor. We love that part. We want to be sat down with the, with you know with the man of God and thirty other people in the high place, and have have you know rub shoulders with all the big important people and be honored. But do we have any humility? Because before that happens, there has to be humility. And the truly humble person isn't going to care if that ever happens. Right. The truly humble person say, you know what? Maybe I never get sat down with the thirty people. Maybe the man of God never comes to me and says, hey, you know, come eat with me. You, you know, because they're in it for the right reasons. They're not in it to just you know, be exalted uh, above measure. <coughs> so he, he's a very humble guy. We can see this about him, you know, with his, with his stature, with his standing, with his obedience, and he's humble with the man of God. But not only that, and this is worth pointing out because this is another thing that, that's kind of gone by the wayside in our society, is that he's humble before his elder. 
Remember that, that Saul, or Samuel's a very old man at this point. You know, he's old and gray-headed, and, and, and he's ready to, to, to pass off the scene. And the Bible addresses this. You know, and this is something that, that people need to understand, too, is that this goes for everybody, is that you know, we should honor those that are older than us. Amen. We really should, and it's a biblical concept. <coughs> if you would, go over, to, uh, go over to Leviticus chapter 19. I mean, it's a command in the Word of God. It says in Leviticus 19, look at verse 32. You're going there. It says, I'll read to you from Proverbs 60. It says, the hoary head is a crown of glory. And now hoary just means like gray-headed, you know, white hair. I don't know what any of that is. I'm, I'm, but he says, you know, the hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. So again, does this mean that every gray-headed guy, you know, you know, does this mean that the burned out hippie with the ponytail you know, who hates God as somebody that we have to honor? No, because he's not found in the way of righteousness. But look, when you have the combination of somebody that's older and experienced and seasoned and is found in the way of righteousness, you know, double honor to that person. You know, show some respect to that person. Look at Leviticus 19, verse 32. It says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am, I am the Lord. That's all one sentence. So this idea of honoring the hoary head and honoring the face of the old man, it's tied in with fearing God. You know, but, but why is that? Because you know, this, this is a commandment of God. And if you fear God, you would obey this. Now, when people stand up, when I walk in and people stand up to shake my hand, I'm like, I'm getting the mirror out. Like, what? <laughs> and I need to go get the, what's that hair dye they, they use? No, I'm just kidding. Someone's going to shout it out and be like, oh. <laughs> right? Uh, but we should, you know, when there's, there's an older person that walks in, somebody who's, you know, lived for the Lord, you know, there's no shame in standing up and shaking that person's hand, saying hello, acknowledging them, you know, saluting them that have the rule over you. That's be like, oh, hey, you know, the pastor walks in or somebody, you know, the, the deacon maybe even, oh, I don't know. And, and it's just like, oh, what's up? <laughs> it's like, okay, well, noted, <laughs> you know. You know, I put out this post on Facebook a while ago, you know, because... You know, be, being the deacon, you know, you're in a position of authority. And I'll be perfectly honest, it's, it's something that took me a while to get used to. Be, and other people immediately caught on to this, and they just started calling me deacon or brother wrestle or whatever. And I was always kind of like, eh, you know, it just felt weird. And I was kind of dismissive about it. But then, you know, even pastor told me, he's like, look, you can't let people just call you by your first name. Because then they'll start to they'll treat you poorly. And what you really have to look out for is when people correct other people and say, you know, he gave this example. Someone said, oh, you know, Pastor Anderson. They said, oh, you mean Steve? <laughs> I mean, mark it down. That guy is a punk right there. Right, right. But he just made the point, look, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a position, you know, in the church. You should have some respect shown. You should have, you know, and not to be called Deacon Wrestle, although it sounds cool, right? <laughs> but, you know, Brother Corbin, Brother Wrestle or whatever. So I put up this post and say, hey, look, you know, from here on out, no first name. It's just, I'm not going to have it, you know, because I need to have a little bit of respect. I think I've earned a little bit, you know. Yeah. I'm not, and I'm not looking to lift myself up. You know, if somebody else became the deacon, I would give them that same Amen. honor. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. I'm probably just getting it on my chest. <laughs> yeah, I totally lost track. Anyway. Oh, what was I saying? Respecting elders. Yeah, salute them that have the rule over you. Thank you. Right? Not just this like, oh, hey. So I put that out there. Thank you. You got me back on track. I put that out there. And then what I noticed was that people that were kind of having a problem with this, now they just don't say my name at all. <laughs> <laughs> now they're just like, oh, what's up? Oh, hey, how's it going? Like they, they, they were saying, hey, Corbin, how you doing? Now it's just like, oh, hey, how's it going? I'm just like, what in the world? You know? <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm not a confrontational type of guy. I don't like confronting people and jumping down people's throats. So I let things slide, but, you know, Maybe I'll just flip out one day <laughs> and just, <laughs> just freak out on somebody. You just gonna catch me on the wrong day and say, sup, Corbin, you know? <laughs> What's up, Corbo? <laughs> and it's different when it's like one, you know, one on one, like it's, it's different. But when it's like in front of, you know, several people at church and you're kind of like, then I have to, you know, make a, anyway, I don't know what I'm going on about this. Anyway, you know, you should honor the hoary head. Now I don't have the hoary head, amen? I'll wait for it. Amen. No, it's, <laughs> it's there a little bit, you know. I blame the job and children, but you know, we should honor those to whom honor is due. You know, whether it's a deacon or a pastor, or how about this, a mom and a dad. 
Right. You know, that's something that everybody needs to learn how to do as children. Yeah. Honor your parents. I mean, that's a commandment in the Word of God. Honor your elders. Rise up before the hoary head. Honor the face of the old man. You know, it's a crown, that hoary head has a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. Amen. You know, and, and that's, you know, that's a way of being exalted. Maybe one day, you know, we'll be that old man. We'll be that hoary head. We'll be that person, that seasoned Christian, you know, who merits some respect from others. You know, from, from you know, maybe, maybe they're not, you know, physically older, but they could be older spiritually. People who've been saved longer. They have more experience. They're seasoned Christians. You know, you want to get that? Well, you're gonna, it's going to take humility. You want to become that person? You're going to have to be a humble person. You have to be the person who's willing to, you know, give that respect before you can before you get it. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 23, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. You know, and that's what you see so many times. You know, I keep going back to these young guys, but you know, that's it's a perfect example. These guys online and others, you know, we could all think of, of other examples. They want to puff themselves up and start running their mouth and tell everybody how, you know, people are doing things wrong and and if it, I did, you know, if I were the pastor, this is what I would have done. This is how I would have handled this and that. But you're not. You're not the pastor, and you're exalting yourself. And you know what? You end up is a base. Yeah. You end up getting called out. You end up getting a phone call, and someone has to chew you out and put you back in your place. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. You know, we want to be exalted. We want to be the hoary head. We want to be somebody that's honored one day. Let's humble ourselves. You know, and, and I, I love this church down here. I mean, I look around, I see a lot of people that are, they're, they're on their way there already. I can already tell that they just keep sticking by the stuff and doing what they're doing, that they're going to be that person that's exalted in due time. You know, and that why? Because they have humility about them. They have real humility. First Peter 5 says this, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Just that, just that alone. You know, we should, we should submit ourselves to older people. And thankfully, I'm still young enough that I can practice this. You know, I could still submit myself to older people, you know. Go back to uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9. And what is this chapter about? It's about humility. Saul was, you know, as, you know, we know how he ended, but let's not forget how Saul started out his life. A very humble man, a very meek man. And it's a tragedy what happened to him. And, it, you know, the, the worst part is, is that, it, you know, that's not how his life had to go. You know, but this is what happens to people. They start out good, pride creeps in, and it ruins them. If you look at uh, 1 Samuel 9, verse 23, And Samuel, Samuel said unto the cook, Bring the portion which I gave thee of, which I said unto thee, set it by thee. And, cook, and the cook took up the shoulder, and that which is upon it, and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, uh, excuse me, and Samuel said, Behold that which is left, set it before thee, and eat. For unto this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat that day with Samuel. I haven't eaten today. This sounds really good. <laughs> I wish somebody would do that. Just like, hey, eat this. You know? He says in uh, verse 26, And they rose up early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul rose, and they went, both of them, and he and Samuel abroad. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before thee. And he passed on. But stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. And I just love that last phrase there. Yeah. Stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. And you know, to tie this in with humility is just that you see people get puffed up. You see people get lifted up. And, and I, already, I already preached about this on, on, Sunday, on Sunday night. You know, the Bible says that the king was to write him out a book of the law and have it with him that he may read, read therein all the day of his, days of his life. Why? What was one of the reasons? That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. Right. And when you see somebody who's proud and lifted up, they're not reading their Bible. They're not. Right. The Bible is a book that will humble you. Because the Bible tells the truth about us. Amen. We read the Bible and go, oh, guilty. Whoops, yeah. Yeah, that's me. Amen. Oh man, I better fix that. It's a very humbling book. And people who get lifted up and puffed up with pride, they don't read the Bible. What do they need to do? They need to stand still a while. They need to put social media away. They need to get off Facebook. They need to quit you know, running their mouth everywhere. They need to just get quiet. They need to stand still. And they need to you know, stand still a while and, and hear the Word of God. Have somebody show them the Word of God. Show themselves the Word of God. Get in the book and start reading it. It'll humble them. So, you know... 
I trust everybody in the room, you know, has a humble heart tonight. Everyone here, you know, wants to serve the Lord, you know, for the right reasons. They're, they're, they, you know, but if, if we see cry, pride creeping into our life, you know, maybe it's time we just stand still a little while and hear the word of God. Amen.